A new day, a new time, a fresh start. That's what we needed. Living in a big city full of smog, noisy streets, full of bustling cars and blaring horns, not to mention bad attitudes on every corner, just wasn't working out for us any longer. We had lived that life for almost 20 years, and it was time for something better. We knew that something had to be out there. My wife and I had always visited the mountains when on vacation. We both loved to hike, fish, and hunt. Coming back home was always depressing. Well, I guess if we're being honest, no one likes to come home from vacation. But for us, there was always an ache in our soul until we got back out there. Nonetheless, we would come home to our corporate jobs and push through, all the while, planning for our next trip. We sat down at dinner one night after work, tired and downtrodden, and we made the decision to move as soon as possible. We sat there and planned the whole thing out. We were thrilled to finally be able to leave. We looked all over the place, hoping to find a cabin nestled somewhere in the heart of the forest with hiking trails, small and big game to hunt, as well as a water source to be able to fish. I guess our dream overtook reality. We didn't find the cabin nestled in the heart of the forest with any of those things. But we did find a nice three-bedroom ranch home that fed our needs about two miles out of the woods on a dead-end road. No neighbors in sight, no smog, no blaring horns, no bad attitudes to find. Well, unless they were our own. We had a large expanse of land attached to the rear of our home, and we also purchased the empty lot beside it to ensure nobody else was able to build on it. This was all ours, and all we wanted to finally do was be able to live out our proverbial dream, just me and my wife. About five miles down the road was a farm. We enjoyed taking walks in the evening, and one night we walked further than normal, and that's when we found it. The owners were working outside, so we walked over and introduced ourselves. Hello, I said as I walked over smiling. I reached out to shake his hand. My name is Mark, and this is my wife, Contessa. It's nice to meet you. My wife interjected. You can call me Connie, she said as she stuck her hand out to shake theirs as well. Hi, I'm always glad to meet new people. I'm Marie, and this is my husband, John. I love your name, Marie said. I can't say that I've ever heard it before. I knew then that my wife and Marie would hit it off well. We told them that we had recently purchased the home up the road and how we had some land and would love to have something like they had for ourselves one day. They had endless rows of corn and a smaller garden off to the side of their home for other produce like lettuce, carrots, potatoes, etc. They seemed to have it all. They were fully sustained without having to take any trips into town to go to the grocery store. John and Marie were kind, well-mannered, and driven. They were in their early 50s and their lives revolved around family and farming. Marie was more than excited to take my wife and show her around their garden, and my wife was more than excited to go. John and I stood leaned up against the cow gate, staring off into the distance at the mountains. So, John, how's the hunting around here, I asked. Any good-sized game to be had? Well, it's not too bad, he said as he repositioned his ball cap. You have your deer here, some grouse, rabbits if that's your thing. Enough, I would say. We also live off of our animals, so we have the meat from our cows and chickens that we harvest and fresh eggs every morning. I don't really do too much hunting. I mean, I do on occasion if I get the craving for some deer meat. But I would think if you're primarily going to be hunting for your meats, then there's more than enough to sustain you and your wife here for sure. Do you guys like to fish too? We absolutely do. John, is there any good fishing around here since you mentioned it? John sighed and took his hat off and turned to face me. Well, yeah, really good fishing to be had, but you have to be careful. Careful of what, John? Cliffs, rocks, terrain? I asked confused by how serious he suddenly became. Is it safe to traverse? He chuckled. I wish that were all it was, friend. Just then, Marie came walking back over with Connie, changing the mood and the conversation altogether. What were you guys over here all serious about, Marie asked. Just guy stuff, honey, John said as he leaned over and kissed her on the cheek. Just guy stuff. I was still curious about what John was talking about, but didn't want to push the envelope. We had just met, and I didn't want to overstep my bounds, seeing as how he could turn out to be a great friend and his wife a great friend to mine. So we finished our pleasantries upon leaving and walked home before it got dark. Connie was childlike as she talked about everything Marie had shared with her. I was happy to see her smiling again, finally. This was my wife. This is who I married, not the woman I lived with in the city. Peace had absolutely found her again, and I couldn't be more glad. I was puzzled, though, about what John was talking about, so I decided that night after I showered that we would go out the next day and take a look around. We woke up around 6 that morning, had coffee and breakfast, and geared up to go hiking in the woods. 
This is going to be great, Connie exclaimed. It feels like it's been so long since we've been able to do this. I looked over at her and smiled. Want to know the best part? We can do this anytime we want. We are no longer tied down to schedules, a clock, or any of that. We walked along for a while, taking everything in. The trees seemed so tall here and the brush was so thick. The terrain wasn't bad. It was a little bit rocky, but easily passable for hiking. The hunting will be interesting, though, with everything so grown up. Anything could hide in there and you wouldn't be able to see it at all. We will definitely need a tree stand if we're going to see anything small, I told Connie. She had stopped to take a drink of her water and wipe the sweat from her face. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I think we need to find a good tree for that while we're out here scouting. We stood there for a while just listening to the sounds of the forest. Birds were singing, but off in the distance away, twigs began to snap and crack. Connie and I unholstered our weapons. This was new territory for us, so we had no idea what to expect. Could that be a deer? Or a bear? It sounded heavy enough to be either. We crouched down and began slowly walking forward, doing our best to be as quiet as possible. As we approached where the sound was coming from, we were met with a tall, thick bramble of bush. We couldn't see through it. All we could tell was color. It was brown, and it appeared to be on the larger side. I bet that's a bear, Connie whispered. I would agree, I said, just based off the color and the sizable steps it was taking. If this thing decided to charge us, we certainly didn't have a weapon with us big enough to take down a bear, so we slowly retreated backwards the way we came. A bear is something there just wasn't protection for. That wasn't something we'd even thought about, honestly. John hadn't mentioned seeing any bears out there. Maybe that's what he meant when he said the fishing is good, but we should be careful. Connie and I made it out of the brush, walked all the way around, and then back down to ensure we were far enough away so the bear couldn't smell us any longer. That's when we saw it. A small river at the base of the hill we had just tracked down. Mark this in your GPS, Connie told me. We didn't bring our poles, but I bet there's a great amount of fish in here. We can always come back later and go fishing. I stood there watching the water run over the rocks, elated to be there and happy this was our home. We suddenly heard those heavy footfalls again. Connie whipped her head around, trying to tell its direction. I pulled out my weapon, ready to fire, just in case. If it charged us, I could at least injure whatever it was. And just then, a horrible stench filled the air. Almost like rotten fish and a dead animal intertwined into one foul odor of its own. I don't remember smelling anything like that near the bear that we saw earlier, assuming it was a bear. Connie, I said, whispering to her. This has to be something else. Connie looked concerned. Well, what else could it be, Mark? It must be that bear, or at least a different one. The only thing is, if it is a bear, it's definitely sick, no doubt about it. It almost smells like a portion of it is decaying, or maybe it's severe infection that we're smelling. Either way, we need to get out of here. If it's some type of rabid animal, they are unpredictable at best. Just make sure the coordinates are marked and let's get out of here. We left the water behind and made our way back towards home. Once we were away from the thick brush and rotten stench, we slowed down our pace. Well, I can honestly say that was the weirdest hike we've ever had, I said. Connie stopped and took a drink from her water bottle. Yeah, I would agree. Next time we come up here, we need to bring some bear spray and our bigger rifle. I still have no idea what was bringing that smell on, but it was terrible. Yes, I'll definitely give you that. I don't think I've ever smelled anything that smelled so foul. Let me ask you this, though. Did you feel some kind of unease around the river, I asked Connie. Connie looked at me puzzled. You mean like scared? Was I scared while we were at the river? I sighed. Well, I guess in a way, but it was just an unsettling feeling that came over me after I pulled out my gun. It was almost like I would regret it if I fired. I don't know. Maybe it was just me. We made our way back home, had some lunch, and started planning and measuring everything for our garden. The next evening, we met John and Marie at their house for dinner and went over everything they had done to ensure that their vegetables would survive not only the sweltering summers, but the harsh cold winters as well. Little did I know, John owned all that land surrounding his home, as far as the eye could see. Over dessert, we talked about that weird day we had had when we went scouting the land. We told them about our possible bear sighting, finding the river, and that awful stench. John leaned back in his chair and laid his fork on his plate. Smell, he asked. You smelled something? Yeah, I said. It was almost like the partial decay mixed with rotten fish. Do you think it was just the smell of all the fish that were there in the water, Marie asked? No, ma'am, Connie spoke up. This wasn't a normal fish smell. 
We fished for over a decade, and I can assure you that it wasn't just coming from the fish that were swimming. This was almost like leaving a fish that you had just cleaned laying on a table in sweltering heat for a few days. It was foul. John cut his eyes at Marie, who instantly looked down at the pie on her plate. You know what I think it was, John said to Marie. Marie rolled her eyes at John. Me and Connie felt awkward at that moment. I know what you think it was, John, but I'm telling you, that doesn't even exist. Not here, not anywhere, Marie said while she was wiping her mouth. But I saw it with my own eyes, Marie, John said sternly. If y'all will excuse me, Marie said, dismissing what John had just said. I'm going to wash the dishes. Here, I'll help you, Connie said as she stood up from the table. John and I sat in awkward silence after the girls left the room. I didn't know what to say at that point, and it seemed that John thought he had said too much. I could hear them in the kitchen talking, but I couldn't make out what was being said. I took a long drink of my beer, and as I set it back on the table, John spoke up. I guess you're wondering what that was all about, huh, Mark, as he glanced over at me. Well, I wasn't going to pry. That's not my business. That's between you and your wife, I said. Come on, John said as he stood up. Let's go sit out on the front deck. We walked past the kitchen, and Marie once again threw a sideways glance at John. Connie smiled, winked, and gave me a shrug of her shoulders. That evening was perfect for sitting out in a rocking chair with a friend. The sky was full of stars with an indigo backdrop which illuminated them that much more. John took a long drink of his beer and set it down at his feet. I guess you really do need to know what's going on. Marie and I talked it over after you and Connie left the first night. She was adamant that she doesn't want me to say anything because she doesn't believe in it and she doesn't want me to scare people off. But I'm telling you now, it's real. That's why the last family left. I'm surprised that they took the time to pack. I cleared my throat and took a drink. What exists or doesn't exist, and I'm assuming scared off the last family that lived in the home we're in now, that has Marie ready to smack you silly in there. John was quiet for a moment. He almost looked like he was searching for the right words to say. He finally looked over at me and said something I would have never thought. Dog man, Mark. There's a dog man that lives in these woods. It's on our property up the road as well as on yours. I've seen it several times. The family that used to live in the home that's on your property were being terrorized. It would take its claws and drag them down the side of the house every night. Did you see the fresh paint out there, Mark? That's why it's there. They had to fix it up before they could sell it. The man used to go hunting with me when I would decide to go. And that's when we saw it. And that's when he and I put two and two together about what was going on at their house. Marie wants to slap me silly because she doesn't believe me. She thinks that family moving was because I filled their head with nonsense and scared them off. I sat back in my chair and slowly started rocking. A dog man, huh? I said. Well, I have to say, I've never heard that one before. I grew up hearing all kinds of folk tales from my dad and my grandpa. I heard all about Bigfoot, Nessie, the Jersey Devil, you name it. But dog man? Yeah, that's a new one for me. My grandpa did tell me a story once about when he was out hunting and he had two Bigfoot flanking him. He said there was one on either side of him, and they were almost escorting him out of the woods. Do you believe him, Mark? John asked. Well, sure I believe him. Who doesn't believe stories that their grandpa tells them? I went out every summer I was there, looking for them all over the property, trying to find them or have an experience of my own. I mean, it never happened, but I still believed him. He told me that sometimes these types of things only show themselves to the people who want to see them. Not to everyone. I just figured they didn't want me to see them for whatever reason. Well, John began, if that's the case, I really wish this thing didn't want me to see it. Have you ever had any incidents here at your home, John? He shook his head no as he took the last drink of his beer. Not one. I don't know why this thing was hell-bent on terrorizing them and not us. I'm glad it didn't, or hasn't, but there has to be some correlation, you know? Have you ever compared yours and Marie's life to theirs? Like, is there something they had that you and Marie didn't at the time that may have been bringing it in? Well, no. I mean, they had a dog, a few small children, and some chickens. But we have cows and chickens too, John said. The dog and the small children, I said. That could be it. I can't be too sure about this dog man, so to speak, because I know nothing of it or its habits. But let's speak hypothetically here and compare it to what I've been told about Bigfoot. Okay, let's hear it. I'm all ears, John said as he turned to face me. John could be quite intimidating at times, and this was certainly one of those times, so I was hoping I would make sense with what I was about to say. So, my grandpa told me several stories. 
He said that female Bigfoot were drawn in by the playing and laughter of children. He said that it was because their chemical makeup is so close to ours, which leads me to believe that maybe a toddler Bigfoot sounds the same as our human children. Now, the males, like all males do, have that territorial gene. That goes for any other mammal they feel causes competition or who they feel would move into their terrain or they felt threatened by. What if by chance that's what happened to that family? John sat silent and just looked at me. I guess that could have been the case. I can tell you that this was no Bigfoot. This was sinister. Evil, if you will. It had the head of a canine with a long snout. It had a large tuft of hair on the back of its neck, but the body of a man, except for the feet. These prints it left looked like dog prints. It was one of the scariest things I've ever seen. Maybe this thing felt threatened. Maybe that's why it attacked the family's home every night. Maybe this dog man didn't like the dog or the children, or maybe both. It's really hard to say if this dog man is what me and Connie saw, but we'll just have to be on our toes more than normal out there, I said. I don't know if there's any firepower that you guys could take out there that would even be able to protect you if you came across this beast again. That's what concerns me. I don't know of anything that would outside of a grenade, John said, wringing his hands together. Shortly after, Marie and Connie came to join us on the porch. John cut his eyes at me as if to say our conversation was over for now, and I caught on to that quickly. It sure is a beautiful night out here, Marie said as she sat down. It really is, Connie replied. Almost a shame we have to head home. I stood up to join my wife. Yep, time to go. It's getting late. I want to get to work first thing on the plans we worked out to start our garden. Thank you guys so much for everything. The information as well as the dinner. It was all great, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. On the ride home, Connie told me that Marie was so upset, and I shared with her what John had told me. Well, maybe not all of it. I told her just enough to where it would line up with what she had heard from Marie. I didn't go into any detail about the attacks on the house or any of that. I honestly don't know how she would react to that, and I don't want her to be afraid that something like that was going to start coming around again since we had moved in. Who knows? Maybe this beast thinks we're the same family that used to live there. We were almost back to the house, and something large darted out in front of the car. I swerved to miss it, and I just did. But it was a close call. What in the world was that, Mark? Connie yelled. Was that that bear? I hoped it was, but it ran so fast in front of us. It was just a blur. A large, furry blur. Our hearts were racing when we got home, and we were both a little hesitant to get out of the car. I was thankful that I'd put the motion sensor light up because it was our only source of light that separated us from the dark woods that surrounded our home. Listen, honey, I want you to sit here in the car, lock the doors, and don't move. I'm going to have a look around and then open up the house. When I signal you, I want you to run as fast as you can inside, understand? I sternly ask her. I grabbed my large halogen flashlight and got out. It lit up the area as bright as day. I didn't see anything around the car or in the front of the house. My heart was pounding as I walked around the sides of the house and into the backyard. We had so much land back there, and whatever that was could be anywhere. Everything that John and I had talked about was ringing in my ears and it was causing me to panic even more. What if that thing that ran in front of the car was a dog man? Just then, I heard Connie blaring the horn and I ran as fast as I could to get back to the front of the house. I shone my light all over, but I didn't see anything. I ran to the car, grabbed Connie, and we both ran in as fast as our legs would take us. I saw it, Mark, and I don't think it was a bear. It was big and tall and it looked like a werewolf but I know they don't exist. Werewolves are only in the movies. So what was that in the woods, Connie asked frantically. I was afraid it would be a dog man, and based on her description, and compared to what John had told me, that's exactly what it sounded like. I was in a position at that moment that I knew I had no choice but to tell Connie the remainder of mine and John's conversation. I know that you said Marie was upset, and no doubt she's afraid that she's going to lose us as friends and neighbors because of what John told me. Marie said these things don't exist, but you know by personal experience that they do. The family that lived here before us were terrorized by what you saw in the woods. John said that he and the guy who lived here before saw it a couple of times when they were out hunting. Marie thinks otherwise. She thinks John scared them off with the tall tales. But that wasn't the case. Connie was silent, and I knew her mind must have been spinning by what I just told her. I couldn't do or say anything that might make it make sense to her. Unfortunately. This was something that she would have to process the best way she could. Are you saying that we're in danger then, Mark? She asked. 
Will this, what did you call it, dog man, do the same thing to us? I honestly couldn't tell you with any certainty, Connie. All I know is that we can't let it push us out like it did the family before us. This is our home and we've worked too hard to finally get here. We are going to do everything we planned before we saw this thing. John said that he and Marie hadn't experienced anything negative. No attacks on their animals, no damage to their home, none of what the other family did. I saw the anxiety in her face lessen a little after a while. I wonder why though, Mark. Why this poor family and nothing for John and Marie? That doesn't make any sense to me. I told her how the previous family's living situation could have played a major role in the thing's behavior. I watched her completely calm down at that point, almost like it clicked with her. I could only assume that she was thinking that we may be fine since we have no children, dogs, or farm animals right now. One thing is for sure, Mark, she said with determination in her voice. You're right. This thing will not chase us away from our home. I won't let it. We are hunters. We have killed very large animals over the years, and you and I can take this dog man down before I let it take our home. I'd never really seen this side of her before. It was a different kind of grit and tension in her voice. She was in the mindset that this was war. I was very proud of her for taking on that attitude and not wanting to pack up and leave out of fear. She's never been a fearful person, but this dog man was straight out of a nightmare. Seeing it at night with its body sticking out of the trees made it worse. Its eyes glowed with an amber color from what Connie had said. She said it stood on two feet, staring at her in the car. Its mouth wide open, and she could see its large teeth. I laid in bed that night replaying what she said. A werewolf. I couldn't even believe that that type of thing existed. Where did it come from? Is it the only one? Are there even more in our woods? There must be. We can't all be experiencing just one single dog man. The next morning, we woke up early and set out to get to the plans that we had drawn up the night before. She and I both kept a watchful eye out for one another. Do we take a chance on getting animals at this point? Connie asked me as we looked over the blueprint and the place that we had laid out for our chickens. We are going to do everything we have always planned. All we have to do is build up everything a little bit further and a little bit heavier to keep these things out. We just beef up our normal precautions. That's all. I am not letting this stop us from doing anything we've talked about. I really want to talk to Marie, Connie said as she gathered up all the chicken wire. She has to know that John is telling the truth, and maybe, if it's coming from me, she'll believe it. I knew that that was a possibility, but getting someone to believe this would be easier said than done. If Marie doesn't believe in these things or any of the cryptids, I don't know if Connie will be able to convince her either. But I also know Connie's mindset, and she'll do her absolute best. Look, Marie, I know how ridiculous this sounds, Connie said at our house over dinner a few days later. I also know it sounds like a half-cocked idea that maybe came from some drunk hunters out in the woods one night, but I saw this thing with my own eyes. I felt the fear that it puts off. I've dreamed about it every single night since I saw it. It is a real thing. John saw it, the previous neighbors saw it, and now we have too. John didn't run that poor family off, Marie. They were chased off this property by a dog man. I was waiting for Marie to storm off from the table as she did before, but she didn't though. She sat there quietly, looking at all of us. John reached over and laid his hand on her arm. You could see the wheels spinning. I don't expect you to instantly believe what we're saying, Marie, John said. I know that would be impossible and also unfair to you, so all I'm asking you is to try to take into consideration, coming from me and now our new friends. Marie still wasn't saying anything. I felt bad for her. I really did. I almost felt like we were having a dogman intervention with her. I guess we really were, though, if you think about it. But I know this is a big pill to swallow. John was so sincere with her, and I could only hope that it would help her to be more open-minded to this. Finally, Marie broke her silence that was hovering over us. It wasn't something any of us expected her to say. I know the stance that I've taken, she began. This is the stance I had to take, though a protection mechanism for myself. I know these creatures exist. I too have seen them, but not here. And I've never told anyone, not even you, John. And I'm sorry, she said. Silence once again surrounded all of us as we sat stunned about what she had just said. You've seen them, John asked? Where? When? I grew up on a farm, that you know. But I experienced one when I was helping my mother hang clothes up on the line one morning. It either didn't know I was there, or it just didn't care. 
It was like seeing a tall German shepherd walking on two feet near the wood line behind our house. I didn't know what it was or where it came from, but I was so afraid. I ran into the house, leaving the clothes in the basket outside. My mother, of course, didn't believe me. The only thing I could do to feel comfortable about going back outside was to convince myself that I was seeing things and that what I saw didn't really exist. Did you see it any more after that? Connie asked. I did, unfortunately. But it had been a few years from the first time I'd saw it. I was packing up my car and heading off to college, and I saw it walking out in the woods, carrying a deer. Once I left, I never looked back, and I swore to myself that I was only seeing things again. When John came to me about this, I instantly dismissed it, because if not, the fear would have been dredged up again, and I wouldn't feel comfortable living in my own home. I told myself that this creature that everyone was seeing must just be a wolf, just a normal, everyday wolf that is perfectly normal and natural. Dogmen don't exist, and that's final. As soon as she finished that sentence, however, something happened that couldn't be dismissed. A loud scraping sound echoed throughout our house. I instantly thought of what John had said about the beast scraping the sides of the house when the old neighbors lived here. Is that what the sound was? The claws of this dog man? Connie and I jumped up from the table. John ran to the windows to close them and make sure they were secure. Marie sat in fear at the table, not moving. I ran and got two guns, one for me and one for John. Connie, you stay with Marie, I said as I was making sure that my gun was loaded. John and I are going outside.